you got your Bibles, I'm going to be reading from the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Yep, you already know. But, I'm not going to start verse 14. No, I'm going to start verse 12, and I have a reason. Verse 12. Let me find again. Okay, there it is. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up the heaven, yeah. that there be no rain, if I com- or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence yes, among my people, says, if my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin, will heal their land. Now mine eyes shall be open and my ears intent unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Father, for this opportunity to preach, Lord, and ask you, Father, to anoint my lips of clay and ask you to anoint each and every person's ear to hear, especially those who are listening other ways and being here tonight. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to preach. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm just, I don't know really what to title it. I'm just going to call it the need of the hour. I really think this is the need of the hour. This morning, I'll tell you exactly what the the text message was. It's from a man in Texas, David Zilmer. And I may not be quoting everything he said, but this is basically a gist. Christians use this. Crow season, not as a vacation, but pray for power and revival. Christians, use this corona season, not as a vacation, but pray for power and revival. Wow, I like that, don't you? Amen. You know, some have lost jobs already, and I know it would be the hardest time you know, to be looking for another job, wouldn't it? So many have closed down. You know, I don't know how it is now, but I know last time I was on unemployment, you had to do it was either two or three a week. I'll tell you, it would be hard to do it now, wouldn't it? I don't know if that's how they're doing it now. I know, I know Justin knows more than I do, brother Justin. But I, I'll let you, I want you to know, this is a bad hour as far as, look here, people are losing jobs. Stores are closing. I'm not, I'm not as worried about the plague or the, the, the virus, pardon me. It's not a plague. It's really a flu or a fever or something like that. Right. I don't think it's really as serious as they made it out to be. Yes, people have died. The flu will kill you. Right. The flu will kill you. And I'm not saying people won't suffer. I've heard a man may have had it, and they say his lungs are messed up. You know, I, I understand things that can happen with the flu and other things. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is, tonight, this should not be a time to take a vacation from God. If anything, it's a time to get closer to God. And I, as I, was, I was looking at these verses the other day, and I'm not here to be critical because you'll probably hear me do this again and again myself. We quote Second Chronicles seven fourteen, and that's it. And that in itself is a powerful verse. Yeah, yeah. It really gives the answer to things. But then I was reading the other day, and it stood out what I call the forgotten context of Second 
Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. You know, there's a, such a thing as a context. Right. You can take a verse out of context right. and preach all kinds of weird things, can't you? Right. Amen. A good example, Philippians, I think it's 124 is 121, where it says, Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for me or something like that or for you all. Now, out of context, it sounds like a libertine verse, doesn't it? But if you read the whole verse, you know Paul's talking about dying. He, you know, struggle whether to live or whether to die because he probably was longing to go to heaven by then. And if the Lord said, come, he would have been anxious to come. Amen. But he said, nevertheless, to buy the flesh is more needful for you. He's saying... For me to live here now is the more important thing. Amen. But you take a verse like that by itself, you can really twist it horribly. On the other hand, this verse by itself is not bad. But when I looked at the context, it became even better. It became it went from one degree of better to even a better degree of better. Yeah, that's really true. Then Solomon, verse 12, offered burnt offerings unto the Lord. Wait a minute, I'm in verse chapter 8, pardon me. Then as the Lord appeared, pardon me, I was in verse chapter 8. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place for myself for a house of sacrifice. This was right after the dedication of the church, of the temple. This is right after the dedication of the temple in Jerusalem. What did he do? After it was over that night, he, you know, I don't know where he went, but the Lord appeared to him. Whether in a dream or vision doesn't really matter. Amen. I think the only difference is between a dream and a vision, a vi- dreams generally after you're asleep, a vision's while you're wide awake. Does it really matter? God appeared to him. Amen. He spoke to him some powerful words, did he not? He said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. You know, he wanted that temple to be a place of sacrifice, a a place where people would have their sins forgiven, a place to worship God. Isn't that like our church houses? I know some people say, oh, it's not the house. I got news for you. I believe it's important we have a church house. Amen. Amen. Whether it's in a beautiful building or whether it's in a home. I'm not worried about that part. But I believe in going to church. I believe in going to church. Let us not forsake the assembly ourselves together as a matter of some is exhorting one another so much as the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. But anyway, there he was, spoke to him. But this place was a place of sacrifice, a place really of worship. Next, verse 13, this is where the text really starts getting good. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, if I send pestilence among my people. Let me go back and take each line. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain. Droughts. Droughts. That's whenever, you know, there's no water for a period of time. Sometimes animals will die. Sometimes gardens will die. He's talking about sometimes he will cause a drought. To happen and even though really it may not always be and i believe this applies probably more to droughts guess what i think just as an overall you could apply it to bad storms too just the opposite because let me tell you like that one sister said i was glad she made the reference to the states georgia arkansas louisiana it wasn't there a tornado not long ago in alabama You know, it's getting to be tornado season. And tornadoes can be very devastating. 
I go out to Oklahoma. I hope to get back before too many weeks. <laughs> I like to go out there, but you know what? Toward, you know what? Oklahoma, Kansas, and Missouri, maybe parts of Arkansas is called, don't you? Tornado Alley. Tornado Alley. I have never seen the twisters, but I have been out there when they were coming, and you could see the signs. One time, I think it was 2015 or 16, I was supposed to preach the next night for Brother Larry Wood. I, got, I was told that there was a tornado on the way. They said heading toward close to Coweta, where I was standing. I think it hit Wagner. You know what? I was asking people. Now, I don't live in the church. doesn't have a basement for me to go to, so where should I go? And they suggested Walmart. Well, I'll tell you what happened in a couple minutes. <laughs> Amen. I went to, uh, when I heard that alarm go off, it sounded like a siren. Sound like, you know, what you'd hear back in the time work. Places were being bombed. I decided it was time for me to get out, get out of that church and head over to Walmart. And when I got there, I saw a cart. The wind was strong enough that it was moving on its own. And I said, it's coming. So I went in Walmart and I went to the back of Walmart in Coweta, Oklahoma. And when I got back there, I said, you all mind if I pray? I don't want to sound like I'm giving myself the glory, but we had a prayer meeting. Amen. I don't know how many people really were praying with me, but we prayed that the tornado would not hit us. I found out, this is what I was ready to say, I found out later on, they said if it would actually hit Quita, it had been heading right to that Walmart. But there was a prayer meeting in Walmart. Hey, Amen. Oh, Amen. Amen. To the sisters here at work at Walmart, maybe you all have, should have a prayer meeting sometime there. But we had a prayer meeting in Walmart. I understand. I never saw it, but they said they put it on Facebook, and people even told me they remember seeing that picture of me on there. That's okay. It don't bother me. But I was thinking, you know, thank God the Lord answers prayer. Amen. He protected us from a, from a, a, a tornado that night. Amen. i tell you something. I, I can tell you some more stories. I'll say one more. One time, I found a tornado out in Oklahoma, a tornado warning, a blessing. 2017 it was. It was back whenever that lady, that lady policeman was acquitted for shooting that black man that was high on drugs. When he stuck his hand in the, tr in the truck and, you know, he was resisting arrest, refusing to obey the cop. And, you know, I feel she was innocent. Just like they said, I was there, Sand Springs, the night they got the acquittal. I said, I got to drive by Tulsa now. You understand there's parts of Tulsa. There's parts of Broken Air. If you go through, you'll enter Tulsa and don't even know it. Then if you go further, you'll enter Sand Springs and don't know it. That's how it is out that area. I said, oh boy, I hope I'm not going to hit the area of Tulsa where there are protests, and I didn't. Well, everything was okay that night. They un understand there was people protesting and unrest. Next day, guess what came on my cell phone? A tornado alert. I don't know where it hit. I didn't run to Walmart that night. I just stayed put. And the next night, I got word that it was going to flood, and I said, you know, I think I better go ahead and leave the church and go elsewhere because I had a feeling the flood was going to make me inaccessible to get back, yeah. and it did. But can I tell you something? I'm thankful for both that tornado alert and that flood. You know, I had to spend the night in the Quita Walmart parking lot sleeping in my car. I thought, thank God it broke up a riot. I'd rather face a tornado or a flood than a riot any day. Mark that down. But you know, once again, I'm trying to say sometimes bad storms will come. It could either be the floods 
a tornado, a hurricane, or it could be a drought. All of them can devastate and all can destroy. Amen. Then it next says, if I command the locusts to devour the land. You know, sometimes that happens, doesn't it? Pest, I mean, not pestilence, locusts. You know, the different type, like some say grasshoppers are a form of locusts. Then there's a locust we call back as a seven year, 17 year locust. And I have seen the 17 year locust eat up the leaves on trees and do a lot of damage and a lot of devouring of stuff. And I sometimes hear about certain types of locusts. They'll go through just almost like an army, go into the fields and destroy crops. As it says in Joel 1.4, that which the palmer worm hath, hath left, the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath eaten, the canker worm eat, hath left the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, the, the caterpillar eaten. Sometimes. Those insects would devour crops and cause starvation, cause food to be almost scarce. Come on. And sometimes I believe it's a judgment of God. And the next one's the main one. Amen. Or if I send pestilence among my people. What is pestilence? Well, 2 Samuel 24, 13 to 17 will answer that very clearly. Yeah. Remember David numbered the army? And he told them, and he was given that choice between what was it? Was it? I don't know about the first two. I know one was three years. The other one was three months. I know one was involving being chased by your enemies. The other one was a phantom. But the third one, was pestilence three days and it made it clear that that pestilence is disease and in three days what about 70,000 people died that is what pestilence is it's disease that's what this coronavirus is it's pestilence I believe it's a man-made pestilence you all probably know that's where I stand I believe it's has a pardon me, but here it goes. It has a made in China uh, on it. I mean, I'm not down on Chinese people, the good people over there. I believe the Chinese church is a great church, and I believe when the rapture happens, I believe the most probably the most people, the, probably the main Christians will go in heaven, and the rapture will be the Chinese church. Yeah, amen. Amen. They might have the plane crashes right and left, but I don't know about this nation. But I believe the Chinese probably will have car wrecks right and left and planes crashing in the buildings when the rapture happens. Because I believe that they're good people as a whole. Amen. Over in China. Amen. And that's probably one of the strongest churches in the world right now, the underground church in China. So don't go out and say, I'm prejudiced against Chinese people. I'm not. That's not the people. It's that government. <clears throat> I don't care what government has the word communist on it. I've often said, I think we need to apologize, put a little apology on Dr. Carl McIntyre's grave because he opposed communism. And what did we do? We belittled him, made fun of him and run him down. But tonight, the Bible says, for nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be phantoms and pestilences and earthquakes in what? Diverse places. Now we a lot of times emphasize earthquakes in diverse places, but I made sure there was a comma after earthquakes too. So you know, it could say, really say there'll be phantoms, yeah. pestilence, and earthquakes in diverse places. We have had several in the past few years, and I believe they're all man-made. SARS, the swine flu, West Nile virus, Ebola, and now the coronavirus. All I believe are man-made. 
And what is the answer? I think the answer is not what's happening now. I don't believe the answer was to close every store down in the country with a few exceptions. I'm really going to say it. Believe me, if there was a, if I was on a ship right now and the plague broke loose, yeah, I'd, I'd expect a quarantine. But this thing that's going on, just a lot does not make sense. You close the church doors down, but you keep Walmarts open, and I'm not opposing Walmarts here. You, go, you close church downs, but the liquor stores can stay open. You, pose, you close church doors down, but the abortion clinics can stay open. I have some problems with that scenario and that big time. I'll tell you what I believe tonight. I believe this has not been done totally right. I will say I agree with, with uh, Donald Trump when he shut the doors from China. I think that was 100% right. I think he did the right thing. And those, those people say he's done nothing this whole time. <laughs> they better get their act together. Because I think he's done the best he could with this. Come on. He may have made mistakes, but they're not. It wasn't closing the doors to China. That wasn't racism or xenophobia. That was common horse sense. In fact, I kind of think he should just keep the doors closed there, but I'll leave that alone. <clears throat> but tonight, what are we to do? What is the hope? If my people, who's that? Back then, it was primarily the Jews. But we're in a different day and age. Before I say what I'm ready to say, I do thank God for every Jew who's what I call completed. That's been truly born again. That's been, that has repented of their sin and got their sins washed in the blood of Jesus. I believe in that. I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm just out to reach the Jews with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I met one man not long ago who claimed to be a, 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 a completed Jew. I'm not going to get on any details whether I think he really is or not. That's between him and God. He want me to go with him to, Jer to Israel sometime. And I, lo I love one thing he said. He said, if we went there, I go in one room, he goes in another. In the room he goes into, they hand him a gun. Wow. And says, and now you're part of our army. Cut him on. But today, it's the born-again Christians. It's not the atheists. It's not the Buddhists. It's not the Muslims. It's not the Roman Catholics. It's those who've been born again, repented of their sin, and found Jesus, or received Jesus as their Savior and Lord, and have been born again and truly changed. Sad to say there's some churches don't preach a changed life message anymore. Uh, and the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. The Bible says concerning the wise men that went to see Jesus in Matthew chapter 2, they went, they left another way. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. When Zacchaeus got saved, what did he do? He went and paid back half his goods he gave to the poor, and the other part he yeah. took and paid people he told, took from by false accusation. I like the way they emphasize that fourfold. He went back another way. And then Saul of Tarsus, based on the way some people are preaching now, they would say, well, he should have gone ahead and after God say he would have been okay for him to go ahead and and persecute the church another year or two while the Lord worked on them. They won't say it, but they might as well. They might as well. You know what he's seen after he got saved and after he got his eyesight? He was preaching the very gospel they tried to destroy. That's what I believe. Those who, who really have been born again, had that changed life, Fallen holiness, amen, without which no man shall see the Lord. But tonight, there's some things the Lord is requiring of us. Number one, it says, if my people, which are called by my name, 
shall humble themselves. I will just spend a couple minutes now on humility. The Bible says, 1 Peter chapter 5, 5 and 6, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. They may exalt you in due time. James 4, 6, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. We need to learn to humble ourselves. Realize that all we have is from God. That it's through Him that we live and move and have our beings. That without Him we are nothing. We're nobody without God. Amen. Don't be like the Governor Kumo of New York. Who really made a blasphemous and a very proud statement not long ago. The number is down because we brought the number down. God did not do that. Oh, I hate to even quote that. Fate did not do that. Destiny did not do it. A lot of pain and suffering did. Oh, that is not humility. That is proud, blasphemy, and rebellion against God Almighty. You know what I believe? There would not be one person survive the coronavirus or the flu or even the common cold if God didn't say survive. I know a lady they set out in Oklahoma, I know about 80s, late 80s, early 90s had the coronavirus. They say the last report she's doing well. You know what? That's God Almighty. That's God Almighty that brought her through it. I tell you what made me think of when I saw that statement of the governor. I couldn't help but think of the people, the men of ba Babel, when they said, Genesis 11, 4, they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. Statement of pride. He reminds me of Nebuchadnezzar, amen, when he said, Daniel 4.30, the king spoke and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by my might, by the might of my power, and for the honor of my majesty? Remember, he got struck down as an animal after that. Thank God he did repent. Amen. It reminds me of Herod in Acts 12. Acts chapter 12, 12 through 21 through 23 says, And upon a set day Herod arrayed in a royal pair, sat upon his throne, and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten up of the worms and gave up the ghost. And one more, I could probably think of some others. But this is the main one I want to bring up. He reminds me of when he said that horrible statement a couple days ago. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. He reminds me of Lucifer. The devil, when he said, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will send unto heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the congregation, the mount of the congregation in the side of the north. I will send above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Bible says, Proverbs 16, 18, 19. Pride go before destruction. High spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with a lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Now I know tonight I'm not talking to Mr. Kumo, though I'll tell you what, I would love it to get back to him. It don't frighten me one bit of him hearing it. Amen. But I'm not mainly preaching for, to people like him tonight. I'm preaching to the church primarily tonight. And tonight... Sometimes pride rises up in our church people. How many evangelists are proud because of how, how, how many great revivals they're holding? I'm not against preachers having great revivals. Amen. I'm thankful for it. 
I'm not down on a preacher who has two or three years in advanced bookings. I think that's great. Amen. I don't envy them at all. If anything, I just ask God to bless them and hopefully it comes my way. But I'll tell you what else. Sometimes I've seen evangelists get proud. I've seen pastors get proud. How big of a church they have built. One of the curses, and I'm not trying to have the fundamental Baptist movement. Of course, one of them is eternal security. But how many of them have had huge churches? And I've seen them fall, too. And because of their boastful ways, we need to humble ourselves. The Bible says, He has showed thee, O man, what doth the Lord require thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Micah 6, 8. Tonight we need to humble ourselves before God that he may lift us up. Then we need to pray. The Bible says men ought always to pray and not to faint. Luke 18, 1. The Bible says, amen, Philippians chapter 4, 6 and 7. Be careful for nothing but everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I believe we need to be a praying people. Amen. 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 The problem, as one man said, I have it written down. Who was it? F.B. Meyer said, the problem is not unanswered prayers, it's the unoffered prayers. I believe that's the problem with the church. We complain when, the, when, when they quit praying in public schools, but how many homes and how many churches aren't praying like they need to? Come on. I believe tonight we need to pray. And then we also, the next section says, seek my face. Now, is there a difference? They're both prayer. But you know, you can pray and lack a certain amount of intensity. I'm not being critical because sometimes you have to pray in a hurry, so to speak. You know, when we pray over our meals, I don't want you to be uh, uh, praying, <clears throat> praying God bless everybody in Bangladesh and this country and that country. And, you know, I think you know what I'm saying. Come on. You know, if we go to a hospital and anoint somebody with oil, I don't expect you to be praying that all the, all the children is in a, in a Nigeria fed tonight. I'll expect you to give a theological dissertation while you're praying for a sick man. But I do expect you to pray, remind the Lord of his promises, and to pray in Jesus' name, trusting God to do the healing. But sometimes we got to go beyond just prayer. We're just praying. We got to go into an intensity with a prayer. Sometimes that intensity may involve fasting. You've got to pray to stay and fast to last. The Bible says, when thou fastest, ouch. It doesn't say if, it says when. Come on, Matthew chapter 6, I forget which verse. But there's such a thing as more intensity. Sometimes we may have to lay aside some things we'd like to do. You know, maybe we'd like to go visit some friends, but we say, no, i got to spend some time praying tonight. I could do that later on. It may be involving some sacrifices, a little extra time. I'll tell you, that's what I mean by seeking the face. When you get more intense, when you get more involved, when you actually, what we call, pray through, kind of like Daniel did when he fasted and prayed for 21 days in Daniel chapter 10. That's the type of praying we need. Amen. Found out that the Lord heard the prayer the first time. He prayed and sent that angel, but he had a run in with the prince of Persia. For those who don't know, Iran is where Persia is was amen the iranian demon i think that demon is still over there too ruling that nation i believe it's still powerful over there i believe it's still a major threat but we need to seek the face of god but one more thing and turn from their wicked ways i could spend some time just naming sins Bitterness, 
Bible warns against having a root of bitterness. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Right after the scripture says, Follow peace of all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Wasting time. How much time are we wasting in this day and age? Jealousy and envy. You know, as bad of a sin as they are, it's often the easiest of the emotional sins to conquer. Rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. If you can learn to do that, envy and jealousy will not stay in your heart long at all. Amen. Gossip. You know, I know there's times to warn people. Like if a lady in this church was dating somebody that's not living right, I expect a pastor or some saint in the church to take her aside and warn her. That's not gossip. That's not gossip. <laughs> to me, gossip is when you're just talking about a brother behind his back, twisting things that may have happened or may not have happened. Come on. Worldliness. That can be a lot of things. It could be everything from jewelry, makeup, women trimming their hair. Come on, if I just do a little, preach a little holiness, it's the late Don, or not the late, still in Brother Don Rich, yeah, pardon Don me. Rich. That's a slip. <laughs> as they would say, as he would say, I believe still the old time holiness way. And by the way, well, I don't believe I have to get up every time I preach and get on women wearing pants and makeup and jewelry and men growing their hair long. Can I say something? It bothers me when you can go to holiness churches month upon month upon month and upon month and not hear it mentioned even one time. Amen. That's right. Now that bothers me. Yes, sir. It doesn't. I mean, I don't expect you. I mean, there's a lot of things you have to deal with because there's attitudes that's worldly. I could just go down a list. But tonight, I think it would be great if some of us would get back to what we used to preach. You'd expect the sinner to hear things like if they had long hair to be told that they, it's a sin, a shame for them to have long hair. Yeah, and there was a lot of times, those were the one times when we were getting people saved right and left. Right, right. Woo! Worldliness. Hypocrisy! Don't do as I say. Don't do as I do. Do as I say. Hypocrisy. Anything displeasing to God. I hope some of these churches which close their doors when times comes for them to open up again still got their members. I don't want to be critical or hard on people as you probably know I'm not. But on the other hand, I think some people will get settled to not want to go back to church. It really bothers me. Anything displeasing to the Lord, it doesn't matter what's not trend in church. Tell them, quote, the white lies, no such thing. Sometimes they do just as much damage or worse than a big black lie because they're not as easy to detect to detect. But tonight, we need to turn from our wicked ways. And then, what does it say? The promise. We will hear from heaven. We need to hear from heaven, don't we? I will forgive, then I'll, I will forgive their sin. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He that covers sin shall not prosper. Whosoever confesseth and forsaketh shall have mercy and heal their land. I actually got more I could say, but I think I'm going to stop here. Other than I recommend you all read Acts chapter 4 and chapter 5. Because that's where they had a real revival in the New Testament. Excellent example 
when the Spirit of God fell. Well, I'll just go ahead and say this much. As a result, unity and love amongst the believers. Acts 4, 32 and 34 to 4, 37. No, it's not preaching communism when they had all things That's common. Right. Exact opposite. It was temporary. It was uh, just for, you know, for a season to get the church growing. It was voluntary. As you find in Acts 5, they didn't have to give everything they wanted. They could have held on. They were not condemned to been sinful. But this is, and there's two things that the communists forget. Number one, it's not, the storehouse is not the government. The storehouse is the church. One more thing. God has to be in it. You kick God out, you can't, it won't succeed. Amen. It's really dealing with brotherly love and unity anyway. Power to witness. Acts 4, 30. Hmm. I can't hear you my own right. 4, 35. The hypocrites were dealt with and taken care of. Acts chapter 5, 1 through 11. Miracles. Acts chapter 5, 12 through 16. Power to stand during persecution. Acts chapter 5. 17 to 42, power to rejoice over persecution. Woo! You know, when revival happens, you can tolerate persecution a lot better, can't you? And the gospel continued to spread, go forth. Boy, now I can stop now, but tonight, I believe that when we, I believe we're going to need revival to see things changed. We want to see this pestilence removed. I believe the church is going to have to get in revival. Not the false church that, that, you know, they just have a little, they have a little, what is it they call? Oh, I forget. They, they call it liturgical, liturgical churches where they follow a little thing everywhere. I call them lethargical churches. No, I believe it's the true church. The church is repentant. Living holy. If we will humble ourselves, pray and seek the face of the Lord and turn from our wicked ways, then we will hear from heaven. The Lord will hear our land. Let's just all come and find a place to pray.